looks like there's a good number of you back here, so uh, we're going to just uh, sing a couple more times before we uh, go on to our next session. Uh, last night, uh, Dr. Green in his lecture was uh, talking about the importance of history, the knowledge of history, and the historical progression in the life of the church. And uh, um, uh, the next lecture is going to have a very uh, historical focus to it as well. So we're just going to sing a couple of songs. And I just want to draw your attention to how they talk about the uh, unity of the church over the span of time. We're going to sing O Church Arise, um, and uh, it, you can pull it up in, in your song sheets there. Take, just pay special attention when we get to the middle of the fourth verse. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of his grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. We have past, we have present, and we have future and a unity among them. So that, I, just, I just wanted to, uh, ha to, for you to have those thoughts in your mind as we sing, O church arise, and then your hand, O God, has guided your flock. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 13, and it's in your bulletin insert. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldiers get entangled in civilians' pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of the Lord. We have been blessed by Dr. Green's exposition um, on areas that interests a number of us. I was delighted that he avoided the minefield of saying anything negative about the French. I, we, we, we would have been in tremendous difficulties knowing the fact that we love the French. Um, uh, the TBS DNA is wrapped up with the French. I mean, after all, it was the French who said that there are only two people in the world, French and those who wish they were French, and <laughs> I certainly agree with them uh, on, on that point. But we are delighted this morning to have with us Dr. Paul Appere uh, from France and his wife, Florence, who is also from Java Street. Uh, Paul and his father before him studied at Toronto Baptist Seminary, and I believe that you met Florence here and were married and are married now for 50 years. Paul has pastored for over 43 years in Paris and pastored the Eglise Evangelic Baptist at the center of Paris for 43 years. I think Lois and I were privileged to visit that church years ago, a thriving, solid work in the heart of Paris. Not only has he pastored for all these years, he has also taught at Nogent and also at, on the faculty of Vosse and he has done so for over 25 years, um, expertise in the Synoptic Gospels and in Janine literature. And so we are delighted to have a friend who come from, who, who is a graduate of the seminary, I think it was in 2011 that TBS awarded him the honorary doctorate degree. And um, I was also benefited even when you were coming to the International Baptist Conference and speaking there. Part of my dissertation was fueled by the interest you sparked at one of those conferences. So, Paul, we are delighted for you to be here. Come now and deliver. We thank you in advance. Thank you very much for those kind words, Glendon. A little over 50 years ago, I was taught here that when you were invited to speak somewhere, you had to start by saying, it's my high and holy privilege <laughs> to be uh, here today, this morning. Well, it is. It is. I would like to thank the member of the faculty uh, for their trust. Uh, they invited me to come and speak to you. And that trust is uh, a token of love which I appreciate deeply. Thank you. I would like to thank too those who worked with me in the preparation of uh, 
of this address. I'm thinking of uh, Debbie, of Anne, and uh, Josh. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the faculty stress was such that I was left uh, with the choice of the subject. And I thought, well, what am I going to speak about? And then I remembered the heading of this conference, the Bowman's Lectures. And I thought, well, that's a unique opportunity, unexpected opportunity for me to uh, give a tribute to a family, the Bowman family, which has been so supportive ever since I met its members 53 years ago. I will never forget the grandfather, Paul, uh, and the sons, of course, Wilfred, and uh, Cliff, and uh, Rudy, and their wives. They've been uh, great assets in our ministry, faithful, kind, generous supporters. And I thought, well, I should choose a topic in relation with that family. Now, some of you know that, uh, maybe not all, that that family comes from Switzerland. And, uh, well, I thought, there I have a, a theme, and it is the radical reformation in Switzerland. Uh, so it's in thinking of that family that I've made that choice. We'll be speaking about a, um, an aspect of the whole reformation which we don't really address very often. Now, the time being limited, I'll narrow our um, uh, objective uh, to uh, one man in particular and his friends, that is Conrad Grable. So, uh, a last word before we start. You have received, I guess, a, a, a paper, the title of which is The Radical Reformation, Appendices. Uh, you might find it useful to uh, uh, refer to it during the conference. I'm going to quote uh, to uh, a number of people and I won't take the time to explain who it is exactly every time. So if you have a doubt, you can always uh, look in this little uh, uh, paper and have the information you need. Now, I was still a teenager when I first heard of Conrad Grable. He made such an impression on me that I immediately set my sights on making him the subject of a personal study. A fine project to be sure, but one that I didn't undertake until 50 years later. Now, the purpose of this address is to evoke the birth and first steps of a reforming movement that grew out of Zwinglian Reformation and which has come to be known as Anabaptism, or sometimes radical reformation, as opposed to the so-called magisterial reformation, that of Luther and Zwingli, for instance. And we shall do this by tracing the careers of three of the very first leaders of this primitive movement, that is Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, and Jörg Blaurock. First, a few words about the context in which the three uh, pioneers of the Radical Reformation emerged and evolved. The geographical context, northern Switzerland for the most part, and the canton of Zurich in particular, and to a lesser extent, southern Germany. 
the political context, independent of Austria since 1499, Switzerland is now a confederacy of 13 quasi-autonomous cantons. Southern Germany is part of the Holy Roman Empire with a handful of territories under the direct control of the ruling Austrian Habsburg family. The early 16th century, which is of particular interest to us here, sees a succession of two rulers. First, Maximilian I, then Charles of Habsburg, known as Charles V. But it is with the Austrian Archduck Ferdinand, to whom Charles V frequently leaves the task of representing him, that the reformers will most often have to deal directly. Now, more important, the religious context. The Roman church is in a bad way, very bad. Its head, for one. The popes, most of them dominated by their thirst for power and their taste for luxury, and lost, lost interest in theology long time ago. But so are its practices, which are increasingly scandalous and unbearable. Particularly shocking are the paid pardons represented by indulgences, all the more shocking in that they are now one of the church's main sources of revenue. It is against this somber background that Erasmus of Rotterdam, a humanist, a man of letters and a canon, vigorously criticizes the church, its hierarchy, its theology, and its rights. In his widely circulated writing, he proposes a return to the sources, that is, a return to scripture and to the church fathers. But he is not alone. Far from Rome, an Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, is particularly indignant that the Roman church, his church, is shamelessly offering the faithful the possibility of buying an early exit from purgatory. These indulgences infuriate him. Until in 1517, he proposes a fundamental critic of them, and on October 31st, posts his famous 95 Theses. Rome cringes, and Luther, like many others before him, are, is excommunicated. But whole cities and princes continue to support him. In many places, Erasmus' return to the source becomes scripture alone, sola scriptura. At the same time, another theological principle emerges, sola fide, faith alone and justification by faith. These reforms take off in northern Germany and multiply, particularly in Luther's home region and Wittenberg. But they soon spread southwards to Basel, Strasbourg, Schaffhausen, Bern, and Zurich. Zwingli, Zurich in particular, where Ulrich Zwingli is winning the city over to the Lutheran cause. Now, who is Zwingli? Quickly, born in the Swiss Alps in 1484, he studies in Vienna and Basel, and soon becomes a humanist and a great admirer of Erasmus. At the age of 22, he is appointed as a priest at 28, he becomes a military chaplain. Four years later, he is appointed director of a once prestigious abbey in the Swiss canton. An excellent Hellenist, he immerses himself in the study of the New Testament. His reading shakes him. 
he becomes aware of the many betrayals of which his church is guilty and decides to preach no other gospel than the pure gospel. In December 1518, is appointed parish priest by the Zurich chapter and pledges before it to have nothing in view other than the glory of God, the instruction and edification of the faithful. His purpose is to return to the common practices of the primitive church and, with God's help, to preach in such a way that no supporter of evangelical truth will have cause to complain. Opposition, sometimes violent, soon arises. In vain, the Zwinglian reformation is underway and nothing will stop it. And so after the emergence in Germany of a Lutheran current outside the church, another Protestant current, the reformed one, appears. And it is from this current that dissident anabaptism almost immediately springs. At first, radicals are on the side of the pioneers of the Reformation. But they are now disappointed by Luther and Zwingli's hesitations or even compromises. So convinced as they are of the total bankruptcy of the medieval church, by choice or necessity, they decide to go their own way. Now, the early days of the Zurich Reformation. When he begins his new ministry in Zurich, Zwingli is well aware of his renowned eloquence. And uh, he is aware, too, that that eloquence will not be enough to bring his reformation project to fruition. <coughs> so without delay, he obtained the legal supports he needs from the 212 members of the city's great council. At the same time, he adds teaching to his preaching and soon disputations in a sense of battles of opinion on point of doctrine are included in his ministry. In Zwingli, Estep writes, quote, the scholar, the humanist, and the evangelical reformer are blended into form an attractive and forceful personality. As a result, he rapidly attracts a number of promising young humanists who, like him, are passionate about the reading of classical Greek authors, and at least as much about studying the Bible, according to uh, Erasmus' approach. Now, from 1520 on, this group includes such young Zurichers as Felix Mons, Hans Hockenfuss, Klaus Hottinger, Heinrich Abeli, Bartley Mepur, and especially Conrad Grebel. Now, what do we know about Conrad Grebel at this time? Born around 1498 into a wealthy patrician family in Zurich, Conrad begins his studies at the Latin school La Carolina. In 1514, he spends a year at the University of Basel, where Glarion, an eminent friend of Erasmus, introduces him to humanist thought and urges him to follow Christ. The following year, he joined the University of Vienna, where another Swiss scholar from St. Gall, known as Vadian, teaches. Conrad and his new master become friends and even parents when in 1519, Vadian marries the young man's sister, Martha. During his three years in Vienna, Conrad Grebel discovers a sort of humanism different from that of Basel. Uh, this one is directly inspired by 
the Italian Renaissance. But Conrad is a dilettante, often neglecting his studies. He goes out a lot with his fellow students. He drinks too much and gets into fights, not like the Tibius <laughs> students do, I, I hope. Yet this doesn't stop him from accumulating conquests and adventures, a life of debauchery that leads him to contract an illness from which he will suffer until his death. Unsurprisingly, when Conrad leaves Vienna in 1518, he is without a diploma. Now, on September 30, he decides to travel to Paris with two friends, no doubt to meet up with Glarian, teaching in Paris. It is to be his last university experience, and a disappointing one. Self-assured, the Parisian masters, with rare exceptions, remain insensitive to the contributions of the new humanism. But Conrad, who lives for a time at Glarion's house, takes advantage of his stay to study rhetoric, perfect his Latin, and learn Greek, and perhaps Hebrew too. Good students. Alas, Glarion and Conrad break up abruptly, and the young man returns to his old ways. Despite his failing health, he joins in all the brawls, except that during one of them, two Frenchmen are killed. His participation earns him the wrath of his father, who deprives him of, his, of a substantial part of his purse and soon orders him to come back to Zurich. On his return, in June 1520, the prodigal son is depressed, unstable, unmotivated, and remains so more or less until the great Zwingli invites him to join his aforementioned group of students. As he reads there in the New Testament and learns to preach the word in the vernacular, Conrad is shaken. His friends are too. So much so that by 1522, Grable and his comrades have become passionate about the far-reaching reformation that Zwingli has begun to promote and seeks to impose in Zurich. But for Conrad, 1522 is also the year of his marriage to Barbara, his holocosm, as he calls her, <coughs> his whole world. Celebrated against his parents' wishes, the event marks the beginning of a difficult period for the couple. Conrad's health is poor and their financial situation increasingly, increasingly alarming. Conrad and Barbara, nevertheless, have the joy of welcoming three children, Theophilus, Joshua, and Rachel. Last but not least, 1522 is the year of God's, of, of God's, of Conrad's conversion. And the change is radical. Says a step again, the author I quote in the, this little uh, paper, quote, the weak, vacillating young humanist has become a soldier of the cross. And it is from the word of God that from now on he will take his orders. Orders which for about 20 months will make him one of the champions of the radical reformation alongside with Mons and Blaurock. Now, it is then, too, in 1522, that some notorious incidents occur, two examples among many. First, the so-called sausage affair, affair. 
On the first day of Lent, in the middle of the fasting period, Zwingli is at the home of the printer Christoph Froschauer, and several of his colleagues are eating meat. They are denounced, and three weeks later, Zwingli defends them in the cathedral. The un this unprecedented challenge to the practice of fasting leads to civil unrest. But the Grand Council sides with Zwingli. Many historians consider this affair to mark the true beginning of the Reformation in Zurich. And in the same year, following Zwingli's lead, a delegation of the Great Council demands that the D Dominican, Fran Franciscan, and Augustinian Manican orders preach nothing other than what has a scriptural basis. To correct the monk's sermons, Conrad Grebel, Klaus Hottinger, Heinrich Aberli, and Bartlim Pur go to the churches to publicly interrupt these preachings. The four men are summoned before the Grand Council, which forbids them to do so. Public disorder is feared. Grebel vigorously defends their cause. They are released. Now from the city, Zurich, the Reformation soon reaches the Zurich countryside. Strongly anti-clerical, villages and farms welcome the new preaching with open arms. They demand and eventually obtain the right to choose their own pastor. Thus, in December 1523, the church in Viticon chooses Willem Röblin as its parish priest, the first priest to marry openly. Openly. And the municipality of Cloten asks for a priest to preach the gospel, and nothing else but the gospel. As for Willem Röblin, it is worth noting that some consider him to be the first of the Swiss reformers to have preached against pedo-baptism. And as the man who convinced Grebel to know no other baptism than that of believers. Now, 1523. The year 1523 is an important one. It begins on January 29th with a disputation the first of its kind, and sees tension rise between the reformers. 600 people are present, a little bit more than here this morning. 600 people are present. The mayor, in favor of Zwingli, presides, arguing that the theological questions could not be decided by any court other than that of the church, the Bishop of Constance is absent, but has sent Fabry as an observer. Fabry is urged to respond to Zwingli on the 67 theses he wishes to address, 67, which could be summed up in these two formulas, sola scriptura and sola, solos, Christus. Fabry resists, but eventually attempts a pitiful reply. At the end of this joust, Zurich officially decides to follow the new theological line proposed by Zwingli. Needless to say, this decision causes quite a stir. For some time now, Andreas Rudolf Bodenstein von Karlstadt, known as Karlstadt, has been denouncing the presence in the church of images that distract attention from the essential, meaning the spiritual. In his September 1st sermon at St. Peter in Zurich, Zwingli Main's collaborator, Leo Judd, openly and passionately attacks the presence of images and statues 
explaining that the time has come to remove them from places of worship. And statues and pictures and oil lanterns and even crucifixes are removed. Offenders are punished. On October 12, 1523, the Zurich authorities asked for a second disputation to address not only the question of images, but also the theological understanding of the mass. The disputation takes place on, from October 25 or 26 to 28. First in the Gross Munster, that is the big cathedral, then in the town hall. Crowds flock, priest too, in large number. The 212 members of the Grand Council are present, as are, of course, facing the representatives of the traditional faith, the leading figures of the Zurich Reformation, and other reformers, like Sebastian Hofmeister from Schaffhausen. Vadian and Grebel, who soon proves to be Zwingli's most resolute opponent on the issues of images and the mass, of course, but above all, on the question of the competence of civil authorities in matters of faith. What does sola scriptura mean? <coughs> Grebel and his friend Simon Stumpf ask if political authority has the power to contradict such clear and sim simple decision. Zwingli defends himself. Feeling betrayed, Grable clams up but thinks no less. On December 18, 1523, Grable is 25, he writes to his brother-in-law, the cause of the gospel is doing very badly here. They, are, they pay little heed to divine authority with regard to the mass by proposing a middle way out of a diabolical prudence. The least we can say at this point is that his, this second dispute is far from satisfying everyone. Now, in 1524, Grebel and his friend Mans and Stumpf submit an alternative reformation project to Zwingli and Judd. The church would no longer be the gathering of the multitude, but only of the convinced ones. To this, Grebel and his friends add that this church of regenerated men and women will have to distinguish itself by the justice of its behavior. Personal holiness, strict discipline, forbidden usury, general sharing of goods, and remuneration of the pastor ensured by voluntary donations. Now furious as, as at being overtaken by his left, Zwingli rejects the project. For him, the Reformation must be endorsed by the authorities and include everyone. The clash is inevitable. Zwingli and Gribble part ways. No one suspects it. But a new church is in the making, one that will be free and of professing believers. The baptism issue. And to start with a founding letter. Aware of their isolation, Grable and his friends decide to turn to other dissatisfied reformers, such as Karlstadt and Thomas Munzer. On September 5, 1524, Grebel writes to Munster, Munzer. His letter is co-signed by five of his companions, and it is a bitter letter. 
the world has never been exposed to so many filthy and pernicious errors. And it is a great misfortune to see the faithful more attached to their pastors than to scripture. And speaking of pastors, they are so irritated and furious with us, young men, that they mock us in the flesh like bulls and call us demons converted into angels of light. But above all, Grebel's letter is of interest from a theological point of view. For in it, we discover the first outline of a new theology, one that will soon be called Anabaptist. Four themes dominate. The Lord's Supper, celebrated soberly. It is a precious reminder of Christ's death. By taking part in this joyful agape, the faithful demonstrate their union with Christ and with their brothers and sisters. Discipline, or the rule of Christ as they call it. What to do when there are divergent readings within the church? Answer, debate. Debate them within the ecclesial community. In the case of proven heresy, nothing less but nothing worse than the ultimate sanction that is exclusion. Violence. Grebel's yesterday's brawler and his followers declare themselves against it and facing Munzer takes a clear stand. We must not protect the gospel and its followers with the sword. Nor must they themselves defend themselves in this way. And then for baptism. It is interesting to note here that Munzer has already criticized infant baptism. The young reformers of Zurich agree with him. Quote, Scripture describes baptism as a sign that one is and will be dead to sin, that one is to live a new life and a new spirit. Now, of the four themes addressed by Grable and his friends in their letter to Munzer, baptism is the most vigorously debated. Zwingli initially opposed the baptism, the baptism of infants. Grebel and Mens even claimed that it is he who first enlightened them on the subject. But faced with the threat of, a, of the schism, oh, schism, schism? OK, you understood. Uh, in Zurich, over the issue, the reformer has backed down. In substance, his, Zwingli's, his argument is, quote, since in the New Testament there is no clear word on the subject, to argue about the form of baptism would be to fixate on external things. True, there is no commandment to baptize infants, but neither is there one that forbids it. And since it's impossible to settle the debate from the New Testament, Zwingli turns to the old, referring to the practice of circumcision to justify infant baptism. Grable, Muntz, and, his, and their friends disagree. What is at stake, they insist, is fidelity to scripture. Quote, a reformed church needs sacraments purified by the biblical gaze. Now, in response, Zwingli publishes a brutal text. Aiming at Grable Circle, he criticizes them for considering infant baptism to be the worst abomination in Christianity and call their members seditious. In early December, Grebel sends a letter to protest of protest and defense to the Zurich authorities, to no avail. 
the disagreement is irreparable and the insults begin to rain down. The proto-Baptist camp. In the radical camp, as we call it sometimes, Gribble and his reformist friends are prominent. But sympathizers from all walks of life begin to swell its ranks. In early December 1524, Grebel publishes a petition in which he denies being a seditionist and above all demonstrates that pedobaptism has no biblical basis. The idea of a third disputation is born. The third disputation differs from the previous ones in that the outcome is known before it begins. The Zurich authorities will rule in Zwingli's favor against the opponents of infant baptism. Heinrich Bullinger, who attends the meeting, described it in these terms in the 1560s. Attending in particular were Mons, Grebel, and Rublin, asserting that baptism must be administered to believers to whom the gospel had previously been proclaimed, who understood that gospel and asked for baptism themselves, putting to death the old Adam and desiring to live a new life. Zwingli then replied methodically, after the disputation was concluded, the Anabaptists were told to renounce their opinion and remain quiet. The fact is that the Zurich Grand Council legislates on January 18th in the following terms. All children must be baptized at birth. All those who have not had their children baptized must do so within eight days. Whoever refuses to do so should, with wife, children, and possessions, leave Zurich without returning or await the consequences of his act. On January 21st, the city authorities become even more unbending. Quote again, Conrad Grable and Mans must stop discussing and questioning the council decision. They must be satisfied with our judgment for there will be no disputes in the future. And we come to that special day, January 21st, 1525, and what we call the first Anabaptist church. The reaction of Zurich's proto-Anabaptist is swift. On the very same day, January 21st, 16 of them gather in a house, we don't know exactly which one, to prayerfully seek the Lord's will. Falling to their knees, one after the other, they ask God most high in heaven to grant them to fulfill his divine will and to show them his mercy. They know they will have to suffer as the result of this official decision. Then the priest, Yog of the house of Jacob, known as Blaurock, rises and begs the group's leader, Grable, to administer true Christian baptism upon confession of his faith. Grable immediately agrees to his request and baptizes Blaurock. Then the faithful who are present beg Yog to baptize them in turn. Witnesses say, quote, they all gave themselves to the Lord in great fear for God. They confirmed each other in the service of the gospel and began to teach and observe the faith. Thus is born the first Anabaptist church of the Swiss Brethren, Saturday. January 21st, 1525. This was clearly the most revolutionary, revolutionary act of the Reformation, Estep writes. No other event so completely symbolized the break with Rome. 
Here for the first time, a group of Christians dared to form a church after, that, after what was conceived to be the New Testament pattern and pledged to spread the authentically evangelical faith everywhere, whatever the cost. And they already knew the cost. Now, the spread of Anabaptism. Zolicon, the decision taken by the Zurich authorities on January 21st, 1525, to forbid the questioning of pedobaptism sealed the rupture between Zwingli and the radicals, Grebel, Mons, Blaurock, and others, and the banishment of the latter. Grebel and his companions leave Zurich and settle in surrounding area. Untiring, especially Mons, a preacher of rare eloquence, and Blaurock, a true force of nature, they go from house to house, bearing witness to their faith, baptizing and celebrating the Lord's Supper according to the biblical model. Days after the first baptism on January 21st, a first structured Anabaptist church is born in the village of Zurichon, near Zurich. On January 22, Pastor Brutley baptizes Friedrich Schumacher, with a simple bucket of well water. Not immersion yet. From January 22 to 29, 35 adults are baptized, most of them small farmers with their wives and workers. The group celebrates the Lord's Supper with ordinary bread and a shared cup. All pray in the vernacular, some prophecy, women in particular, and at least initially, the sharing of good is practiced. The Zurich authority are quick to react. On Monday, January 30, the police arrives in the village. Brutley has already left, but they arrest Blaurock, Mons, and the 25 newly baptized farmers. Halau and Schaffhausen. Meanwhile, Röblin and Brutley settle in Halau, a small village near Schaffhausen. They then move to Schaffhausen to meet up with Grebel. There, the three men meet the reformist pastor, Sebastian Hofmeister. Hofmeister seems to agree with their concept of baptism, so much so, that in fact, that he is prepared to inform the city council. But having learned of the Zurich Grand Council's decision, the local authorities are keen to reassure Zwingli and order that all children in Schaffhausen must be baptized. Hofmeister backs down. Now, after his release, Felix Mons, who had been arrested, travels to Schaffhausen, where he preaches a nonviolent Anabaptism similar to the one Grebel has told Munzer about. And Grebel baptizes too. A certain Wolfgang Uliman from St. Gall in particular, about whom we need to say a few words here quickly. A former priest, <coughs> Uliman has rallied to the thesis of the radical reformation. He now, he now wishes to be baptized by Grebel, but by immersion. And he says, not with just a bowl of water. Immersion. Grable complies. It's February. Uliman undresses. The two men promptly plunge into the freezing waters of the Rhine, and Grable fully immerses Uliman. Well, apparently they survive. <laughs> but, but back to our young radicals. Brutley and Rublin are appointed pastors in Halau. Their ministry is particularly fruitful. Rublin baptizes a large part of the town and country population. Waldshut now. Our friends also make frequent visits to Waldshut in the southern Germany. Rublin in particular, with his Po Olay. 
he baptized in droves. First, a few citizens outside town. Then on April 15, some 60 inhabitants in Valshut itself, in the public square. And the following days, Easter Sunday, 300 believers. What a dream for us, pastor. Thus, in the wake of its pastor, Balthazar Hummeyer, the entire population embraces, embraces the thesis of the radical reformation. And Walshut becomes the first example of a town officially declared Anabaptist. St. Gall, from Schaffhausen, where he has only been for a short time, Grebel travels to St. Gall. He was invited there by two of his converts, Gabriel Geyer, and above all, Wolfgang Huliman. St. Gall, where two reformed churches coexist, that of Vadian, close to Zwingli, and that of Wolfgang Huliman, a convinced Anabaptist. Grable's preaching with over a multitude of people, so much so that on Palm Sunday, April 9, 1525, he and his friends baptized around 500 people in the Sitter River. Grable then returns to Zurich and Bolt Eberly from the canton of Appenzell takes over. His preaching immediately meets with even greater success than that of Grable. But the scale of the movement is worrying. Like Zurich, the city decides to react. Eberly has to leave St. Gall. Uliman replaces him and gathers large crowds. This time, it is too much. Rejecting his brother-in-law's powerful, moving, and hurtful plea, Vedian persuades, persuades the authorities to ban the Anabaptist brethren for good. Uliman, in turn, has to leave town. Now, shortly afterwards, on May 29, Eberly is burnt at the stake by the Catholic authorities of Schwitz in Lachen, thus becoming the first Anabaptist martyr. Gruningen, Grebel's stay in Zurich, is a trying one. Grebel feels that Zwingli will have him arrested. He keeps a low profile, rarely meeting his brothers and writing to them instead. And then there are the two other enemies who never give up on him. His health, as bad as ever, and his financial situation so strained that he even considers selling his library. So after a brief visit to Waldsert in early June, Grebel travels to the Gruningen region where he grew up. Gruningen, where Peasants are fighting to regain their political, economic, and religious autonomy. Gruningen, where Blaurock and Mons soon join him, along with reinforcements from Zolikon and Valshut. Grebel and his friends work tirelessly. Always, as always, they go from house to house, convincing even the most hostile. They also preach here and there, everywhere, calling their audience to repentance, faith, baptism, and sanctification. For there is no other subject that matters to them. And their efforts are soon rewarded. This is the region where Zurich's radical reformation enjoys its greatest success, but then a particularly violent wind of opposition blows in. A slight flashback. While they were winning over the people, Grebel and his friends did not hesitate to push around sometimes rudely, rudely local officials. All the while, they refrained from inciting the crowds to take their side against the authorities. But on October 8, 8 1525, while Grebel, Mons, and Blaurock are preparing to hold another unauthorized meeting in Hinville, the bailiff of Gruningen, Jörg Berger, has Grebel and Blaurock arrested. The two young evangelists are incarcerated in the castle's dark tower. Mons escaped in time, but three weeks later, in, on October 31, he too is arrested and thrown into the same jail as his friends. Now, to avoid a popular Uprising, Berger organizes a disputation on November 6, chaired by four theologians, including Hofmeister, now in Zurich, and Vadian, still in St. Gall. 
On one side, the Swiss brethren, Grable, Mans, Blaurock, and a certain settler. On the other, Zwingli, Jude, and Grossman. The exchange lasts three days in the presence of a large crowd, but comes to nothing. On November 18, Grable, Mans, and Blaurock appear in court. The prosecutors are Zwingli and Hofmeister. They skillfully avoid theological debate and use dubious testimony to persuade the court that it is dealing with seditionists, revolutionaries, and communists, going so far as to challenge the very legitimacy of the civil authorities. Grable, Mans, and Blarock are sentenced <coughs> to an unspecified term of imprisonment for anabaptism and improper conduct. Far from being despondent, Grable takes advantage of this confinement to write a treatise on baptism between songs and prayers. He's, what, 27. But his writing only makes matters worse for the prisoners, who are tried again on March 5 and 6, 1526, 28 is 28. And this time sentenced to life imprisonment in the sinister Wallenberg Tower. Life imprisonment. And the following day, March 7, the authorities announce that anyone who proceeds to rebaptize someone will be sentenced to death by drowning. But two weeks later, on March 21st, thanks to the complicity of anonymous benefactors, the three young men escape. Grable, who once again leaves his wife and children behind, Mans and Blaurock immediately resume their itinerant ministry and in and around the canton of Zurich. Grable and Mans then move to Appenzell and Graubaden, Graubunden, other cantons in Switzerland. There, Grable goes to Mayenfeld, where he is stricken by the plague and dies in July-August. A year and eight months or less, a step rightly summarizes. A year and eight months or less encompasses the whole ministry of Conrad Grable as an Anabaptist preacher. A few sermons, numerous letters, many imprisonments, or one pamphlet, a few baptisms, much poverty, misunderstanding in his home, and this honor in his native canton mark the tragically brief career of the earnest reformer. And we come now <clears throat> to the end of an era, or the disappearance of the leaders whom Estep rightly calls the meteors against the night. A disappearance that opens the way to other less orthodox leaders, some of them particularly violent. A word about a Grable, a victim of the plague, as I said, Conrad Grable dies in July, August 1526, 28. Quoting Bender's Conrad Grable, thousands of martyrs followed in Grable's train, but Conrad Grable was the first Anabaptist. He performed the first adult baptism in Zurich in January 1525. He was the first to clearly mark the road away from Luther and Zwingli's Mass Church into the free, voluntary commitment, brotherhood, and full evangelical discipleship of separation of church and state and of freedom of conscience. Months. Felix Mons, having been in just about every dungeon in the region, is drowned on January 5, 1527, on the orders of the Zurich authorities. Heinrich Bullinger recounts, led from the Wellenberg Tower to the boat through the disorder of the fish market, he, Mons, praises God that he is going to die for his truth. On the way, his mother and brother come to meet him and urge him to, to hold on. And he perseveres in his madness right to the end. As he is tied up and the executioner prepares to throw him into the water, he sings in a loud voice, 
in manus tuas domine, commende spiritum meum. In your hand, O Lord, I remit my spirit. The executioner then throws him into the water and he drowns in the icy limit. Blow rock. On the day Mons drowns in the limit, Blow rock, because he's not from Zurich, is only, only severely beaten and expelled from the city. Indomitable, he preaches in Bern, then in Biel, where he finds a sizable Anabaptist community, the fruit of his own labors. But he also has to leave Biel, banished by the authorities. He then travels through the cantons of Graubunden and Appenzel, arrested for the fourth time on April 21st and banished, he takes refuge in Tyrol and at the Adij Valley in particular. There he sermonizes and baptizes ever-growing crowd. So many, in fact, that the authorities begin to worry. Finally arrested on, October, on August sorry, 14, 1529, he is sentenced to the stake and burned alive on September 6th. Thus, Anabaptism and martyrdom become synonymous. Everything was done to stifle its voice. Stifle? Stifle? Stifle. Everything was done to stifle its voice. In vain. In vain. Why? Because you just can't kill the truth. And history will prove it. Now, in closing, a quick look at the main offshots of Anabaptism. May I recognize a number of uh, denominations, the Hatterites, the Brethren, Mennonites, the Amish, the Swiss Mennonites, the Dutch Mennonites. They all come from the Anabaptist. And the movement started on that particular day, Saturday, January 21st, 1525. Well, that will be all for today. <laughs> and, uh, okay, that now, now that you're awake, we'll pray. <laughs> Lord our God, we... Remember that you've asked us to, re to remember those who have uh, come before us, whom you've saved, whom you've enlightened, whom you've used to proclaim the truth in spite of all the hostility of the world. We want to remember them and their example. They, times have changed. But holding the truth today is not much easier than it was at the time. And the tempta and temptation is, is great for some of us to well, to, to quit. Lord, in your mercy, grant us <coughs> the same courage that, that the one that Grable and his friends and so many after them had. Grant us this passion for your word, this passion for your truth. Grant us to be so devoted to its teaching that we are ready to endure hardship. And then when times are getting hard, Grant us the perseverance, the courage that we will need 
so that we will never be ashamed. Thank you, Lord. You've heard this prayer, and you will answer it. going to encourage you to stand up and stretch for about 30 seconds before we continue. <laughs> We don't have an official break at this particular point, but we're just going to sing a couple of times before we go into the last. Last session is.